do this. It's my turn to pray. Okay. Your turn to pray. Yep. My turn to pray. <laughs> <clears throat> Our dearest Father in heaven, we thank thee for the opportunities we have to learn and grow. We thank thee for being part of our life and loving us and for all the things that thou hast given unto us. For we know that all good things are from thee. We are especially grateful for the Christmas season and for the fact that even people who do not know or understand or believe in thy son, um, we all just sort of focus a little bit more on love and kindness and goodwill. And all of those things draw us closer to Christ, whether people believe in them or not. And it is such a magical time of seeing the power of the Savior and what he could do with the world if we could just humble our hearts and, and turn to him. We just pray that thou will help us to do that today, that we will enjoy book club, that we will use it wisely, and that we will have the inspiration we need to reach out and help those around us to have better health, to feel loved, and to just be better people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Mm. Do you want to turn to read too? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Yeah, this is the time. Just make sure I stop when I'm supposed to. We we stopped right at the letter, like the paper was never mailed, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, my, my guess, guess is, is mm -hmm. okay. Jinx. Okay. <laughs> My guess is, and this is only a guess, that after writing that letter, Lincoln looked out of the window and said to himself, just a minute, maybe I ought not to be so hasty. It is easy enough for me to sit here in the quiet of the White House and order me to attack. But if I had been up at Gettysburg, and if I had seen as much blood as Meade has seen during the last week, and if my ears had been pierced with the screams and shrieks of the wounded and dying, maybe I wouldn't be so anxious to attack either. If I had Meade's timid temperament, perhaps I would have done just what he had done. Anyhow, it is water under the bridge now. If I send this letter, it will relieve my feelings, but it will make me try to justify himself. It will make him condemn me. It will arouse hard feelings, impair all his further usefulness as a commander, and perhaps force him to resign from the army. <clears throat> so, as I have already said, Lincoln put the letter aside, for he had learned by bitter experience that sharp criticisms and rebukes almost invariably end in futility. Theodore Roosevelt said that when he, as president, was confronted with a perplexing problem, he used to lean back and look up at a large painting of Lincoln, which hung above his desk in the White House and ask himself, what would Lincoln do if he were he, if he were in my shoes? How would he solve this problem? The next time we are tempted to admonish somebody, let's pull a $5 bill out of our pocket, look at Lincoln's picture on the bill and ask, how would Lincoln handle this problem if he had it? <laughs> I love that. I'm going to have to carry We're a $5 funny. bill in my wallet. All We're the time. Funny, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Mark Twain lost his temper occasionally and wrote letters that turned the paper brown. For example, he once wrote to a man who had aroused his ire. The thing for you is a burial permit. You have only to speak and I will get that. See that you get it. Whew. On another occasion, he wrote to an editor about a proofreader's attempts to improve my spelling and punctuation. He ordered, set the matter according to my copy hereafter and see that the proofreader retains his suggestions in the mush of his decayed brain. <laughs> oh, <laughs> lady. The writing of these, I know, the writing of these stinging letters made Mark Twain feel better. They allowed him to blow off steam and the letters didn't do any real harm because Mark's wife secretly lifted them out of the mail. They were never <laughs> sent. <laughs> Good job, Mrs. Payne. <laughs> Do you know someone you would like to change and regulate and improve? Good, that is fine. I am all in favor of it. 
but why not begin on yourself? From a purely selfish standpoint, that is a lot more profitable than trying to improve others. Yes, and a lot less dangerous. <laughs> Don't complain about the snow on your neighbor's roof, said Confucius, when your own doorstep is unclean. It's true. When I was still young and trying hard to impress people, I wrote a foolish letter to Richard Harding Davis, an author who once loomed large on the literary horizon of America. I was preparing a magazine article about authors and I asked Davis to tell me about his method of work. A few weeks earlier, I had received a letter from someone with this notation at the bottom, dictated but not read. I was quite impressed. I felt that the writer must be very big and busy and important. I wasn't the slightest bit busy, but I was eager to make an impression on Richard Hardy Davis. So I ended my short note with the words dictated but not read. <laughs> He never troubled to answer the letter. He simply returned it to me with this scribbled across the bottom. Your bad manners are exceeded only by your bad manners. Oops. <laughs> True, I had blundered and perhaps I deserve this rebuke, but being human, I resented it. I resented it so sharply that when I read of the death of Richard Harding Davis 10 years later, the one I thought, the one thought that still persisted in my mind, I'm ashamed to admit, was the hurt he had given me. Wow. If you and I want to stir up resentment tomorrow that may wrinkle across the decades and endure until death, just let us indulge in a little stinging criticism, no matter how certain we are that it is justified. When dealing with people, let us remember we are not dealing with creatures of logic. We are dealing with creatures of emotion, creatures bristling with prejudices and motivated by pride and vanity. Bitter criticism caused the sensitive Thomas Hardy, one of the finest novelists ever to enrich English literature, to give up forever the writing of fiction. Criticism drove Thomas Chatterton, the English poet, to suicide. Wow. Benjamin Franklin, tactless in his youth, became so diplomatic, so adroit at handling people that he was made American ambassador to France. The secret of his success? I will speak ill of no man, he said, and speak all the good I know of everybody. You know what? That just sounds fun. Yeah. It's way I mean, regardless of, I know, right? Regardless of how successful it is, that just sounds like I would feel better being that way. Yeah, way better. Because <laughs> yeah. you're not out to like improve everyone. You just get to praise them. Well, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but like there's just a heaviness in criticism. You know, it's like you're kind of scrunched up inside. Yeah. And when you can let that go and just see the good, it's really like this just light, free, I don't even know, just this open feeling, you know, and you just feel like you can soar or something and they feel the same way. That just seems more fun to me. Oh my God. <laughs> Any fool can criticize, <laughs> condemn, and complain, and most fools do. But it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. Oof. A great man shows his greatness, said Carlyle, by the way he treats little men. Hmm. Bob? Hmm, I know, right? <laughs> that, that, that includes children, I yeah. think. That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah. My, my little people. Yeah. I have some work to do here. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Bob Hoover, a famous test pilot and frequent performer at air shows, was returning to his home in Los Angeles from an air show in San Diego. He described in the magazine Flight Operations, at 300 feet in the air, both engines suddenly stopped. By death maneuvering, he managed to land the plane, but it was badly damaged, although nobody was hurt. Hoover's first act after the emergency landing was to inspect the airplane's fuel. Just as he suspected, the World War II, II propeller plane he had been flying had been fueled with jet fuel rather than gasoline. Upon returning to the airport, he asked to see the mechanic who had serviced his airplane. The young man was sick with the agony of his mistake. Tears streamed down his face as Hoover approached. He had just caused the loss of a very expensive plane and could have caused the loss of three lives as well. You can imagine Hoover's anger. One could anticipate the tongue lashing that this proud and precise pilot would unleash for that carelessness. But Hoover didn't scold the mechanic. He didn't even criticize him. Instead, he put his big arm around the man's shoulder and said, 
to show you I'm sure that you'll never do this again. I want you to service my F-51 tomorrow. Wow. Often parents are tempted to criticize their children. You would expect me to say, don't, but I will not. I am merely going to say, before you criticize them, read one of the classics of American journalism, Father Forgets. It originally appeared as an editorial in the People's Home Journal. We are reprinting it here with the author's permission as condensed in the Reader's Digest. Father Forgets is one of those little pieces which dashed, dashed off in a moment of sincere feeling, strikes an echoing chord in so many readers as to become a perennial reprint favorite. Since its first appearance, Father Forgets has been reproduced, writes the author W. Livingston Lawrence, in hundreds of magazines and house organs and in newspapers the country over. It has been reprinted almost as extensively in many foreign languages. I have given personal permission to thousands who wish to read it from school, church, and lecture platforms. It has been on the air on countless occasions and programs. Oddly enough, college periodicals have used it and high school magazines. Sometimes a little piece seems mysteriously to click. This one certainly did. Father Forgets by W. Livingston Lard. Listen, son. I'm saying this as you lie asleep, one little paw crumpled under your cheek and the blonde curls stickily wet on your damp forehead. I have stolen into your room alone just a few minutes ago as I sat reading my paper in the library. A stifling wave of remorse swept over me. Guiltily, I came to your bedside. There are the things I was thinking, son, I had been cross to you. I scolded you as you were dressing for school because you gave your face merely a dab with a towel. I took you to ask to task for not cleaning your shoes. I called out angrily when you threw some of your things on the floor. At breakfast, I found fault too. You spilled things, you gulped down your food, you put your elbows on the table, you spread butter too thick on your bread. And as you started off to play and I made for my train, you turned and waved a hand and called, goodbye, daddy. And I frowned and said in reply, hold your shoulders back. All right, then it, to stop there. <gasps> I know. All right. Oh, I've had one of these days. I can tell already I'm probably going to be teary by the end I read. I'm like, I'm glad you're ready. Well, you know what? Let's just finish this because there's this and one more page and we'll just finish it. Okay, keep reading. Oh, okay. You want me to finish, you want me to finish the chapter? Yes. Oh, okay. Good luck. <sighs> <clears throat> then it began all over again in the late afternoon. As I came up the road, I spied you down on your knees playing marbles. There were holes in your stockings. I humiliated you before your boyfriends by marching you ahead of me to the house. Stockings were expensive. And if you had to buy them, you would be more careful. Imagine that, son, from a father. Do you remember later when I was reading in the library how you came in timidly with a sort of hurt look in your eyes? When I glanced up over my paper, impatient at the interruption, you hesitated at the door. What is it you want? I snapped. You said, you said nothing, but ran across in one tempestuous plunge and threw your arms around my neck and kissed me and your small arms tightened with affection that God had sent blooming in your heart and which even neglect could not wither. And then you were gone, pattering up the stairs. Well, son, it was shortly afterwards that my paper slipped from my hands and a terrible sickening fear came over me. What has habit been doing to me? The habit of finding fault, of reprimanding, this was my reward to you for being a boy. It was not that I did not love you. It was that I expected too much of youth. I was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years. And there was so much that was good and fine and true in your character. The little heart of you was as big as the dawn itself over the wide hills. This was shown by your spontaneous impulse to rush in and kiss me goodnight. Nothing else matters tonight, son. I have come to your bedside in the darkness and I have knelt there ashamed. It is a feeble atonement. I know you would not understand these things if I told them to you during your waking hours, but tomorrow I will be a real daddy. I will chum with you and suffer when you suffer and laugh when you laugh. I will bite my tongue when impatient words come. I will keep saying as if it were a ritual, he is nothing but a boy, a little boy. I'm afraid I have visualized you as a man. Yet as I see you now, son, crumpled and weary in your cot, I see that you are still a baby. Yesterday you were in your mother's arms, your head on her shoulder. 
I have asked too much, too much. <clears throat> Instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. There's a lot more profitable and intriguing, that's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. As Dr. Johnson said, God himself, sir, does not propose to judge man until the end of his days. Why should you and I? <sighs> Principle one, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. What a powerful chapter. <laughs> oh right? my God. That's just chapter one. <laughs> Tears. Uh, okay, so I'm... Uh, mm, give me... Mm, <laughs> <laughs> I hold it together so I can read and then it like I let it all yeah it's like one of the most powerful books on the planet right here every parent needs to read it every for real parent, every person every human like think of how much better our country would be if they just read that chapter you know and applied it it's no wonder that's been reprinted a bazillion times needed that reminder with my kids we're gonna need that today so watch out something's, something's coming <laughs> our kids are gonna be really horrible today <laughs> not necessarily they may just have a few more bumps in the road that require you to mother yeah we're gonna be so patient today it's gonna be amazing so loving because of that <laughs> yeah all right. Good day. Good day. 